We'd like to greet you in the name of Jesus this morning. We thank you for tuning in to our Bible study. We're thankful to God for this access that we have on the free conference line. You're listening to this now and you want to be with us next Sunday morning. The number is 945-218-0121. Put in the code 533-7999 and push pound and you will be in the live service. But we are thankful that you are either listening to the tape or that you are with us. Now, if you have your Bibles, you know, come into Bible study. We need your Bibles. Amen? Amen. We are still in the book of Hebrews, chapter 10 and verse 15. We are dealing with the fourth warning concerning the third command, if that makes any sense. So, Amen. reader, if you'll read verse 15 for us of chapter 12, we'll get Amen. our Bible study started. Amen. Amen. And the word reads, look intentionally, least any man fails of the grace of God. Let any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Okay, we have, thank you for, for reading the word of God to us. You know we've been in studying the movement of the house of God. And I'm not going to go back over all of those introductory remarks, but it began in Ephesians 4 in verse uh, 14, really back to verse 12. And so we are now involved in our base verses, Ephesians 5 and 14, Awake thou that sleepest. Arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee life. And so we believe that the people of God are living in a day and age and a season when we are called upon to stand in the gap for God. We need to stand up and be counted for the name of Jesus. So thereby we need to, I believe, not listen to so many voices that we have around us in the world today. When my mother and dad were raised, all they had was a radio. As I mentioned last week, but now look at what we have in our palm. We have a computer that can reach around the world and be advised of any moment of anything going on anywhere in the world. So we have to be really diligent as children of God concerning as parents, taking care of our children, guarding them, and even guarding our own eyes and our own ears what we hear from this world. We need to be mindful that we are believers in Jesus Christ, that we that our allegiance is first to God, amen, and amen. then to my family, and then to my workplace, and it falls on in order from there. But as we look at verse 15, Looking diligently is the third command, and we've already talked about what that means. But there is a warning, and they, there are five warnings, and we're on the fourth one. If we don't obey the commands, having been chastened of the Lord. You see, it began in verse 12, if you would please. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down to the people's knees. So that was the condition they were in. They were wanting to yeah. quit. They wanted to give up. They wanted to turn back. They were tired of suffering for the name of Jesus in the first century church. And so Paul revealed to them why God did bring chastisement to the people of God. Why did he do that? Well, to conform us, for sure. To confirm us that we are children of God. And to certify us that we are part of the body of Christ. He is our Heavenly Father, and He cares about us. And so when you see these things, then you understand that God is not hating on us or condemning us, but He's what? He's correcting us and bringing us in line with His will that we might be able to receive all of the spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus. Man. So we come now to, again, this fourth warning. 
And we have already been involved in this fourth warning for many messages already. But there were two results, and I want you to see them at the end of verse 15. They are what? Uh, in the middle of verse 15. Uh, read, they will trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. So what, what is the problem with the root of bitterness troubling us? Well, what the problem is, it produces bitter fruits. Mm. And we discussed that as extreme wickedness coming in our lives, did we not? Yeah. And so as we developed this theme further, we noted three bitter fruits. The first one was compromise. And that was in message uh, 231, if you're on the YouTube looking them up, on the 29th of, of October. Then we came to the second fruit, and it was change. That was all involved in that message. Then we came to the third fruit, and we called it context blurring. Content blurring. And there in message 232, which was last week, the 4th of November, we tried to define what it means to have context blurring. And we defined it like blurring of the true meaning of Scripture and the deception of what is the truth and self-justifying interpretations that are contrary to Scripture. So we not only look at the definition, but we look at the cause. How did we get here? And we blamed it on the preacher. Do you remember? Mm -hmm. We started with a man of God when he would substitute the message of Jesus and the message of the kingdom for something else. And what is that something else? Well, many people today think that's too simple to preach on Jesus and Him crucified, and so they've substituted the kingdom message for their own prophetic dreams and visions and prophecies. But when you evaluate those things, they don't come true. And mm. so we reject any other vision unless it's in the Word of God, because it will be true then. The only vision, the only word that we need in Hebrews 1, and 1 is, and God said that his son, in his son, he has given us his word in these last days. So when preachers preach another subject besides Christ and him crucified, Paul called it another gospel. I call it a new cart doctrine. When we don't preach Jesus and the kingdom and the responsibilities, of that kingdom, we're not telling the citizens how to live in this age that we live in. And so we talked about that for some time. But now we want to come to the second part of context blurring this morning. We want to talk about the cost that's involved when a person or a believer gets into the shape of being in compromise and change his diet and change his food and change eating at the table of God and start eating at the table of the devil, we want to look at the cost of this. So number one, and I'm, there are six of these. We're only going to do five of the day, Lord willing, and we're going to do the first four probably rapid, so I want you to listen carefully. Number one is, when you find yourself utilizing the wrong Bible, so-called paraphrases, really they are commentaries, they are not the Word of God, because they don't have a word-for-word -word translation. And that's caused yeah. many problems today because there are so many so-called translations, but they're really not translations, but they're really paraphrases or commentaries that people have adopted because they say it's easier to read. So you have to be careful about that. Number one is a loss of fellowship with Christ. Now, we have looked at this many times. But in 1 Corinthians 10 and 21, it talks about eating at the table of devils. You can't drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Mm -hmm. And so it's the same truth in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 in verse 14 through 17. And let's go there just a moment because I want you to see where it is. You may know, but it's verse 17, reader, that we want you to read. 
Second Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 17. And the word reads, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separated, said the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. So if you go back and read verse 14, you realize you cannot be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship, and there's our word, Tonania, has righteousness with unrighteousness. You see how incongruent that is, that it's opposite poles. It's 180 degrees different. What people don't want to investigate is the word Tonania. Fellowship, communion, the same word in the next verses. But you see, we cannot have true fellowship with Belial, or the system of the devil in the next verse, and with God. God is a jealous God. And Mm. he demands our total loyalty unto him because we are now servants of righteousness and not servants of unrighteousness. Amen? Amen. And I want to go to Matthew chapter 6, 24 before I leave this point. I think we're all aware that you can't have uh, two masters. But I want you to know where it is. Let's go to Matthew 6, 24, reader, and read that. Amen. And the word reads, No man can serve two masters, but either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other, yet cannot serve God and man. God and them. Right. So as, as saying the same thing, I just wanted you to have some verses at your fingertips to know why is it that the preacher is saying you will lose fellowship with God if you have another master. And I think mm. that just makes common sense. You cannot follow two masters in the world or you can't follow two masters in the spiritual realm either. And so these are yeah. verses that will help you with that. We've been over that many, many times. Number two, if you are context blurred, if your perception of what is true in the Word of God, or that the Word of God is true, rather, then you will lose your witness for Christ. We talked about this several times. You cannot be salt and light and a disciple of Christ and be a follower of the world's religion. Because the world's religion is not in conformity to what we find in the Word of God. Amen. And so in Luke chapter 14, in verse 26 and 27, and I think we'll just go there and read those verses so that you'll have verses in your hand to know you're either a disciple or you're not. Amen. But so many people, and that's where hypocrisy comes in, as Jesus described the Pharisees, he called them hypocrites. Why did he call them hypocrites? Because they seemed to be so holy, but their heart was far from God. God was yeah. not first love and submitting to God. Do you follow me? Man. So read, read me verse 26 and 27. Amen. And the word reads, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children, and brethren, and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Now, we've read these verses many times. I just want you to have them at your fingertips. Because... Church, we are the children of God. We are the citizens of the kingdom. Our loyalty is not to family first, which some people say that that they should be, but that's not so. Our loyalty is to the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we love him, we'll love our family. I promise you that. If we love like Christ loved the church, we'll love our wife and we'll love our husband. Are you with me? Yes. Amen. And I'm not going to stay here because this is the second loss, the loss of your witness for Christ. You either are a disciple 
and people identify you as a disciple or you're not. And if you are, then these verses help you to get on your way being a disciple, and that word means a mm. follower. Are you with me? Yes. Number Amen. three, if we are context blurred, a third loss is the loss of ability to pray to Christ. Now, we have noted Isaiah 59 and 2 as a reference. And it plainly says that our iniquities, that God will not hear us because our iniquities have separated you and me, God said. Mm. He was speaking through the prophet Isaiah in the days 800 years before Christ because Israel was committing spiritual adultery. They had replaced God as their first love. And they'd gone a whoring after false God, and God is a jealous God, and he will not allow that. And so mm-hmm. if you're not going to make God first, quit trying to pray every time you have a need. You need to be committed mm-hmm. with God see, without ceasing. You need to pray without ceasing, Paul said in First Thessalonians. Yes. We need to pray without ceasing. What does that mean? That means be in tune with God at all times. What is required of that keeping a clean heart? You know, you can't go to God all muddied up. You've got to come to God and say, God against thee and thee only have I sinned. God search my heart and try my thoughts to see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me to the way of everlasting. I want the living out of me, God. I want to be clean, God, when I come to you. I don't want anything separating you and me. I want my love to be uh, toward you, God. Do you get that? Yeah. But why would you pray to a God if you suspect there is a God anyway? If you doubt God, why would you even pray? But when you get context blurred, as we're going to discuss today, things happen in your mind that make you doubt and suspect comes of God and His Word, and you get in trouble. Yes. So my question is, why would you want to pray to a God you don't even know if it's so or not? You follow that? Now, number four, the loss of the blessings of the abundant life in Christ. The thief cometh to steal, kill, and destroy, John 10, right? But Jesus said, I have come to give life, and it more abundant. Abundant. I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Now, I, I do want to spend just a little time on this, because I want you to go to Hebrews chapter 4, reader. And I I want to tell you right quick, there is the word R-E-S-T. You cannot be in suspect of God and His Word. You cannot listen to another gospel that says it's not grace alone, faith alone, and Christ alone for your salvation. Mm -hmm. You cannot go to another gospel that is a gospel of works. You cannot go back to types and shadows and sacrificed animals. You saw I preach a week never do that. Oh, they're, but they're going to try to build a temple and do that. Mm-hmm. You're going to have your eyes open for long. They're going to try to build a temple and they're going to support the Jewish people, the rabbis over there, and they're going to have, in Numbers 19, they're going to have the red heifers they're going to slay to purify the priests so they can go back into the service of Christ, uh, of God rather, and they're going to look down on the rock of Omar, and they're going to try to get that mosque of Omar blown off the rock and have people of America and everywhere in the world, Christians, build another temple. Get ready for it now, because it is coming. But in Hebrews chapter 4, and I want you to, to, I think, think, reader, I'm going to read this, because I've got to jump around. Are we there? Hebrews chapter 4. Let us therefore... Fear lest they promise being left us entering into rest. His rest. You'd have to go back to chapter 3. But I want you to circle that word rest. What does that word mean to you? How many children of God today do not realize by being blurred and compromised and changed and context blurred, blurring, that they lose this rest that's in God? You have to go back to chapter 3 and verse 19. How did they lose that rest? He says unbelief or disobedience. You see that? Mm-hmm. Chapter 3. They couldn't go Amen. into Canaan land because of unbelief. They departed from the living God. They said, we don't believe you, God. We, we, we doubt you, God. 
Mm. They're giants over that land. I know you said we could have it, God, but we don't believe you. Mm. Mm -hmm. And so consequently, they fell in the wilderness. Only their children and Joshua and Caleb could go across. And Paul said in verse, I think it's verse 8 or 9, I don't have my Bible open right here, but verse 8 or 9 says that you've departed. You, brethren, take heed lest you depart from the living God. Let's go to chapter 3 just a minute. I'm having to use this magnifying thing to see the Word of God anymore, and it takes me time to get there. Yes, Lord. But in chapter 3, and I want to look at verse 8, I believe it is. Uh, no, it's down on further. It's verse 12. He said, Take heed, mm-hmm. brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Now, I want to lift that statement out because that's what we do when we find ourselves in compromise and change, eating at a different table, eating different food than the Word of God. Mm-hmm. Then this context blurring comes on us and we, we start losing things with God. All right, number rest. Let's go back to chapter 4. I want to talk about the rest, and then I'm going on. In chapter 4, let's go back. I, I'm going to have to read it because it's not way it's going to make any sense to it. Verse 2. For in us was the gospel preached as well as of them, but the word preached did not profit them. Talking about the Old Testament in the wilderness, okay? Mm-hmm. Not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest. Yes. As he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my wrath, although the works were finished from the time foundation of the world. Hmm. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on his, this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my wrath. Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, And they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief or disobedience. I circle that word. I said you lose the blessing of the abundant life. Why did I say that? Because when you're disobedient to God, you cannot understand what you're doing in the land of Canaan because you don't understand it. You don't perceive that you're following Joshua Jesus. It's not heaven, contrary to gospel songs. Mm-hmm. Canaan land is a place where we receive in this life our inheritance. Mm-hmm. We start enjoying the inheritance given by Joshua divided the land for us. Now notice this. Mm-hmm. Seeing therefore it remained that some must enter therein, but they couldn't because of unbelief. Verse 7. Again he limited a certain day saying in David, Today after so long a time, as it is said, Today if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart. For if Jesus, or Joshua, had given them rest, then would he have not afterward have spoken of another day. Key on that. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. Now I want to digress here just a moment. I know it's taking my time. But folks, I believe the rest that remaineth to the people of God is understanding our rest in the kingdom of God. Hmm. It is resting in Christ. Yes. Canaan land was only a type. For he that is entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own work as God yes. did from his. How much plainer can that be? Hmm. Hmm. But see what Paul doesn't go ahead and explain fully here because you've got to go to other parts of the Bible. You have got to be faithful to God. Yes. You have got to have God as your first love. Mm-hmm. You have got to give your body, soul, and spirit to God to enter into this rest. Mm-hmm. It's a total thing, but when you enter into this rest, you have a peace that passes all understanding. Yes. Philippians yes. 4 and 6 and 7. But you see, you have to be a disciple of God to enter into that, because when you are, you're totally saying, I surrender to the sovereignty of God, I submit to the will of God, and I obey the word of God, and I endure in the same. Are you following? Look at verse 11. Paul was saying to them prior to the understanding of the glory of God coming to them, let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest. 
It's going to be a labor, children of God. It doesn't come easy because there are trials and troubles and tribulations. There are times that we don't know what's going on. Are we going to be still? Are we going to go ahead of God? Are we going to get ourselves in trouble? Are we going to wait on God? Mm -hmm. See, it's hard to pray and be still long enough for God to impress us which way to go. Because we don't like to be still. We don't like to wait, but if you read Isaiah chapter 40, the last three verses, you'll find out what it means to wait on God. Your strength will be renewed. You have the wings of eagles. You'll be flying with God. Mm -hmm. Are you following me? Mm -hmm. You can run and not faint and walk and not get weak. You'll be strong in the spiritual realm. Let us labor to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. What example? Chapter 3. The rebellion they had in the wilderness toward God. Now, I've taken up a lot of time with that, but if you want to live the abundant life, you have got to learn Matthew 11 and verse 28. I might as well go there. Matthew 11 and verse 28. I quote this every time I close a service in the prison setting. Every preacher needs to quote this in Revelation twenty two seventeen, Verse 28, reader. And the word reads, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Verse 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your soul. Yes. Thank you. For now, my yoke. Two times he's used the word rest. Is that not right? And Verse 28, I will give you rest. That's right. You see, we, we, we're not being preached these things. People are not being taught these things such as I'm telling you today. When we get this context blurring on us, we get into a euphoric kind of worship, and it's not anything built upon the rock. Hmm. There is a great possibility, if you're in some kind of euphoric worship of loud music and clanging of drums and all this stuff, it's nothing wrong with it if it's to the glory of God. But if, you don't, if you're not careful, you're getting lost in that stuff. Hmm. And those people that do that, do they, could they give an answer to the hope that lies within them? What they need to do is find out where their feet are planted. Mm. You've got to have a rest in God. But to rest in God, you've got to come to God. Come to you all that are labor and heavy laden. That's where most of us are most of the time. But if you won't rest in that labor, he said, I'll give it to you. That's a promise. Take my yoke upon you. Now, we don't like that, do we? Mm -hmm. You see, if you take the yoke mm -hmm. of the Lord on you, you're going to say, I am a disciple. I am a follower. Are you with me? Yes. Yeah. And lean and learn of me. And lean on me also. You see, if we're going to use Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, uh, we're going to lean on the Lord. We're not going to trust in ourselves. We're going to trust in the Lord and lean on His understanding, not our understanding. And he yes. said, I will direct your path. Proverbs yes. 3, 5 and 6. So take my yoke upon you and learn of me. And for I am meek and lowly in heart. And ye shall, he said it again, find rest for your, or unto your soul. Mm -hmm. Now, if we don't, if we're not founded on the rock, if we don't have a clear vision of Christ and what he's teaching in the word of God, we're always topsy-turvy. We're just bouncing around. And we don't got doubt today, and we're afraid today, and we got fear today. But see, if we are on the rock, we trust in His Word. Do you follow that? Amen. If the Lord lets me, I'm going to try to explain why I've made some of these statements. Let me say quickly. Also, you lose, you lose power with God. You lose the joy of the Lord. Did you know in, in Nehemiah 8 and 9, it says the joy of the Lord is our strength. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, mm -hmm. Now, what does that mean? That means I'm happy with God. My body may be falling apart. Hmm. And mine is. And all will as they gaze, as they age. It's part of the process of aging. But Paul said, though that my body is falling apart, my spirit is being renewed in the inward man. Mm -hmm. And so if we fasten our minds upon Christ, we can enter into that rest, we can have the power of God and the joy of God. Yes. And so there are many more things to discuss under the abundant life, but we went over that many, many times. Now I'm finally getting to number five. Now I want you to listen carefully. I don't know how long that you'll be able to stay with me, but I'd like to get number five before I get to number six. Makes sense, right? Amen. <laughs> the loss of gaining more knowledge of who God is. If we are blinded by what we see in the Scriptures and just say, well, I don't understand that. I don't know that. Well, have you prayed about it? Have you gone to God about it? Have you humbled yourself before God? Have you sought out a man of God? Have you sought out somebody that might help you connect some Scriptures? In the book of First Peter, let's turn there, please. Let's go to 2 Peter, reader, and read me chapter 3, verse 18 to get us started with this. Amen. This is one of the greatest losses we can have. Amen. And the word reads, But grow in grace and in knowledge of the Lord, the Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory, both now and forever. Amen. Thank you. Now, you see, Peter is saying, this is what we must do. We must grow in grace. He was speaking to the first century Christians. I'm speaking to you. It's still in the book. It's still a fact. It's still true. Therefore, we cannot stay babies on the milk of the Word, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11 on through 14, <clears throat> but we need to grow. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen. Amen. What are we growing in? Look at this, church. Look, please. We're growing in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> I've said this many times to you, but if I don't get anything else over to you today, where is your level of knowledge of Christ? Where do you think yourself, if you looked in the law, the perfect law of liberty, you continue there a while. What would you see about yourself? Let's go to chapter 1, please. Reader of Second Peter, chapter 1. And verse 8. Amen. And the word reads, For if these things be in you, and abound, they may make you that you should neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you were sitting in an English class, the word for, F-O-R, beginning that statement, we can use it as because of. Looks back mm -hmm. to, what are we saying if these things we have to go to verse 3 and 4 and 5 and 6 and 7. Amen? Mm -hmm. You can read those for yourself, but it's partaking of the divine promises of God. Mm -hmm. We already know we're children of God, verse 3. He's already done that for us. Mm -hmm. But then when you get down to it, there are responsibilities for us to increase in the knowledge of God. Amen. But the preacher can't do that for you. You have to do it for yourself. I am instructed to lead you to the table. I try to present truth to you, give you verses, but you have to absorb them. You have to meditate on them yourself. Mm -hmm. You have to digest the Word of God. And so what you want to do is Peter said we need to grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. How do we do that? He tells us in chapter 1. I'm not going to go back over that, but I will do this. 
I do want to read verse 9, if you would, please, reader. Amen. And the word reads, But he that lacks these things is blind and cannot see or fall off and has forgotten that he was purged from his old sin. Thank you. Let it be noted he's not, not saved. What is the problem? He's forgotten. He is in a blurred situation like I'm preaching. The third most dangerous fruit is context or content blurry. It's when you get to a stage of verse 9. But it's because you lack these things that you become blind and cannot see afar off. Read verse 10. Wherefore, the rather brethren give diligently to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye should never fall. There again, these things go back to verse what? Four, five, six, and seven. You got me? For so an interest shall be ministering to you abundantly. That's where we started our study on number four. Lose the blessings of the abundant life. In the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now we will get to the kingdom part, but we're not there today. We're talking about the cost of not increasing in the knowledge of God. Well, somebody said, well, how am I supposed to do that? Well, find you a man of God that you know is a man of God. Not just say he says he's a man of God. And listen, search the scriptures and see if these things be so. Read the word of God for yourself. Study the Word of God, and pray God illuminate your mind. Hmm. Yeah. Also, I would get rid of all paraphrases. I would not find me a so-called Bible that was not either the American Standard Version or the King James Version or the English Standard Version. Hmm. Stay away from these newfounded things because they are not translations. I stick with the King James because I believe it's the closest one of all. But all three of those I mentioned, there's just a small iota difference in it. Nothing doctrinal. He might have a comma here or a period somewhere else or break a paragraph here or there. You understand what I'm saying? Or it might use, like in the New King James Version, they have a, a name instead of conversation, they'll say behavior. Get away from paraphrasing. Because you get to believe in what that man wrote in there is inspired. It is his opinion. It's not from Jesus. Amen. It may be from Jesus, but he needs to do what Jesus said, not what he said, how he said mm -hmm. it. Read what Jesus said. Yes. Now, listen carefully. I'm going to preach a little while. With doubt is given a foothold in the believer, guess what? A door is opened. Hmm. Now listen carefully. If you don't hear anything else again, I make the same statement again. When you allow doubt, and it comes from listening to a preacher that has substituted what Jesus said for his own Prophecy, vision, and all this prophetic stuff. You need to go to the Word of God, what God said, and obey what God said. Now listen, the first thing happens when you allow doubt to come in, you question who God is. You'll say, well, where is God? I don't see Him. I don't feel Him. What is God doing right now? I've been told all my life He was omnipresent, He was omnipotent, and He was omniscient. But how do I know all of that? My Bible that I'm reading, it doesn't say that. Well, how many passages have you read 
that prove he's all powerful, he has all knowledge, and he's everywhere. It's in the Word of God, which you've got to link the Scriptures up. Mm. But when you start down the road of doubt, you start saying, you know, I don't even know if the Scriptures are inspired. Mm. You know, I don't know about that Paul fella. Now, I might take the red letters in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and I'm not sure that about that. Now, the reason you say that is because the lie reveals your evil deeds. Hmm. John three nineteen and 20. When we don't want the light of what it says, we try to change it, we try to justify it, we try to change it around where we can operate in our own selfish way and get away with it. <laughs> you cannot allow yourself to say the scriptures are not inspired. Amen. If you do, you might as well throw it all away. Yeah, that's right. That's right. You might as well throw it all away if it's not true from front to back. Because we may not know how to interpret it. I agree to that. We may have a little different shade of how that and what that means, but let the Word stand by itself, church. Amen. We don't need to add anything to it. We don't need to yes. take anything away from it. Yes. I want to share this with you, not to embarrass anybody, and I wouldn't do that for ever, anything. But I had a dear sister tell me that one of her children, who is almost out of teenage years, that he said, you know, Mom, he said, I don't know which Bible is right. Now listen to that statement. <laughs> you read the NIV or you read the international version or you read something else and they all are different. <laughs> Now, how do I know which one is right? You see where I'm going with that? Mm-hmm. When you allow doubt, or when you let a word that's called a holy Bible in your house, you need to know that it is a valid translation. Yes. Because what you're doing, you're putting it in the hands of your children and making them doubt. Hmm. Because when you get to paraphrases, are people that have their notes at the bottom, people say, well, maybe they, that's what God means. That relieves them from praying and seeking God themselves. Hmm. However, the church is the pillar and ground of truth. That's why the pastor better be a man of God in the Word. Hmm. Hmm. Because he has been commissioned in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 12 through 14, 15 to do that very thing. And when he does not preach the word, be it instant in season, out of season, then the people are going to be confused. That's why I said it starts with the preacher. And so be very careful what you put in the hands of your children. Even what you put in your own hands. Now, I'm biased to the King James Version. I don't, I'm not ashamed about it. I believe it is the closest thing we can have to the Word of God. I believe it is the Word of God. I believe it, it is inspired of God. It is without error. I trust it. Next, when we question who God is, We question the Word of God. And thirdly, we question salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. So he says, well, I just can't believe that God would come down, take on the body, and allow people to crucify. I just can't believe that that happened. Why would anybody have to go to a cross and said, in my place, be my substitute. Mm. Because he's the only perfect one, for one thing. Yes. He is the Lamb of God, without spot and without blemish. 
It had to be a perfect lamb. And he's God in the flesh. And so you get all confused when you're in context blurry. And pretty soon you, you say, well, maybe it's by some works. Huh? Maybe I could work my way and please God. Well, you see how that'll work for you. Because one morning you get up and you don't love God, and next morning you get up you do, and one morning you get up you're going to work for Him, and next morning you decide to do something else. <laughs> see how that's going to work for you before the judgment. Hmm. If it's anything but the blood of the Lamb, then we're in trouble. Now, another hmm. thing. When we allow doubt to come into us, we're not growing from babyhood to maturehood, right? Because we're questioning hmm. God. We question the Scriptures. We question the doctrine of salvation. And then, listen carefully to this. We question anything that's contrary to allowing me to operate under my own rules and not God. You know why? Because we don't like to be put under restriction. Hmm. We don't like to be restricted. We mm. like to have free reign. We don't want God to be controlling us. Mm. But you know what? That's a, a product of church. That is really saying that you're not submitted and surrendered to God. Mm. You're not really accepting that you are a servant of God instead of a servant of right, unrighteousness. Mm. Yes. We don't really want to understand First Corinthians chapter six and verse fifteen, uh, nineteen. Excuse me, that we are not our own; we're bought and paid for with a price. That in verse twenty, we are the temple of God. He said, "We are where God dwells." Read Romans chapter six, verse four through verse twenty-two. Sometimes. So what happens is, when we get off in context blurry, I'm gonna close it. Our conscience is dumb. We have a seared conscience with a hot iron. We're excusing sin in the flesh because we don't like what it does to us. We don't like to face sin. And so what we do, we just don't want anybody preaching on sin. Mm -hmm. What we do, we just want a preacher to preach on love. But if you read Romans chapter 3, the law is what condemns us, and Paul, he spent the whole chapter 3 revealing that we are sinners. Why? Because in the last part of chapter 3, he reveals our righteousness is Christ. Yeah. But you see, if you don't have an understanding that you're a sinner, then you won't need the righteousness in verse 24 of chapter 3 of Romans. And then lastly, I'm going to say this in close. When we allow context blurring to come, not only do we lose fellowship, not only do we lose our witness, not only do we lose our ability to pray, not only do we lose that rest that God has for us, we lose power with God, prayer with God, we lose that sweetness with God, but also our learning stops. We stop maturing in God. Mm. Now listen carefully. What kind of degree of learning would you like to plant where you live, where you work, and where you play? As soon as I got my degrees from education, I want to put them in a plaque, and I want to hang them on the wall. But there was one degree that I should have had hanging in my life. You know what that degree is? Holy Spirit power. Hmm. What we need is a degree. We need to go to the University of God. We don't need to be in the University of Philosophy, this world. We need to be in God's university. And when we are attending God's university, do you know that we're being molded and shaped into the child of God he wants us to be? You say, well, preacher, I'm in a valley right now. 
I know it, you can be healed in the valley. Mm-hmm. Did you know that? Well, well, preacher, I'm on the potter's wheel. I've, I've never been like this before. Maybe God's got something real sweet for you. I know he does. Because in our troubles, what do we do? We call on God. Yes. That's, Father, we thank you for this day. I know it's been long, God. But I needed to get up to this point, if, if all possible. Father, I pray that you would break this message down to us. In these little 45 minutes or 50 minutes, it's just so hard, God, to lay it line upon line and preach that whole preacher. But we've been over so many of these things. But this context blurring, God, has really got a hold of me because that's why people are in the shape they're in. They don't know what the Word of God says. Mm, they know what they've it. heard. They know what they've heard. But what does God say? Always help us, God, to go back to your word and line it up with your word. And then we will be in the safest part of the channel. We will be in the deepest of waters. We'll be headed toward the North Star. We'll have God. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.